Pray with me, please. Lord, we confess that we have this week attempted to satisfy our souls in so many places other than in you. And so we confess and acknowledge that as we come to your word, we need to have our affections renewed. We pray that as we turn to it now, that we would not see it as the natural man sees it, who is unable to understand it because it is spiritually discerned, but by the light of your spirit, you would so illumine our hearts so as to be able to understand spiritual truths, spiritual truths that would change us and change our hearts. So Lord, lighten our darkness. In Christ's name we ask it, amen. Turn, if you would, in your copy of the scriptures to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Pastor Doug said I could preach on verses 1 through 5, but I think we'll just finish 2 Thessalonians this morning, don't you? (laughs) We won't. When is it that as children we learn to be afraid of the dark? When does our naive innocence give way to the terror of what lurks in the nighttime closet or what troll-like creature waits for us beneath our bed when we close our eyes? It is strange how before we ever know how scary the world really is that we learn to be afraid. Learning to fear comes easily to us. Learning to not be afraid is much harder. When I was a child, I figured that my mom and dad weren't afraid of anything. I used to imagine that when I grew up, that I wouldn't be afraid of anything. Growing up does change things. It is no longer those unexplained, strange shadows on my bedroom wall or things that go bump in the night that terrify me. But when I look at our world, when I look around at our society, when I look carefully at our culture, and then I turn and I look at my wife, and I look at our kids, sometimes I feel that I am very afraid. There is an old Chinese curse which states, may you live in interesting times. These are interesting times. And yet, fear for the future is unbecoming for the Christian for whom the intentions of evil, wicked men, or even the plottings and designs of the devil himself pale in comparison to the love and steadfastness of the promises of God. And so this morning, I am thankful for the needed encouragement from our text to turn our attention away from the chattering fears that would consume our hearts toward the steadfastness of Jesus. So read with me our text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Finally, brothers, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. We continue this morning our study through the book of 2 Thessalonians, and our text today begins with the word finally. It's a word that indicates to us that there is a change in topic, that there is a scene change that is happening in Paul's letter as he now shifts from the body of his communication to the church at Thessalonica to now his concluding remarks as he prepares to wrap up this letter. 
But that hardly means that what comes here is disconnected from the broader themes or context of the overall letter. So I'd like to just briefly reframe the context of our passage this morning so that we can grasp the thrust of Paul's argument here. Paul is writing to a church that we know that he dearly loves. In fact, he calls them brothers more than all of the other times he refers to the other bodies of congregations as brothers in any other of his letters or in all of his letters combined. This is a church that is very close to Paul's heart, and it is also a church that he knows is suffering under the weight of some severe anxieties. And so he's writing these letters to this church in order to calm their hearts. The Thessalonians are living in the midst of a pagan society. They are surrounded by a deeply immoral culture. Resistance to Christianity is rising around them, and the threat and, in fact, the experience of persecution for this young congregation is very real. In fact, things have gotten so bad around them that added to the list of their other concerns is added this new fear, what if Christ has already returned and we missed it? And so Paul writes these letters to the Thessalonian church to explain to them that the Lord has not yet returned, that their hope in his return remains living and active, but things will continue to deteriorate until he does come. And so it's a little bit of a mixed bag response for the Thessalonians because their hope is renewed and yet it presents them with this whole new set of problems, namely... While they continue to eagerly await Christ's return to deliver his people, and while things continue to grow worse around them, how should they be living in the meantime? And that is a question with tremendous application to our own situation today. We live in eager hope for the imminent return of Jesus Christ but also compelled to engage in the problems and perplexities, in the difficulties, in the dangers of a world that despises Jesus. We were pointedly reminded of this reality on Tuesday with the passage of Proposal 3 and the knowledge that horrific disregard for human life is now a celebrated constitutional right in our state. Which I think just serves again to make our passage this morning particularly relevant to us. I should note that this passage and this message were not selected in response to the events of Tuesday. That's the beauty of expositional preaching. You preach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and what's next is next. And yet in the providence of God, this passage this morning is next. So this passage was selected before the events of Tuesday. My sermon outline was written and finished on Tuesday afternoon before the outcome of any ballot proposals was known. And yet I think in the providence of God, it is a passage for us this morning. And here is the main idea from our text this morning. In times of spiritual darkness, uncertainty, and danger, Christians are to be people of activity and hope. In times of spiritual darkness, uncertainty, and danger, Christians are to be people of activity and hope. We're going to be examining this central theme from our text through four observations that emerge from this passage, two of which are concerned about how we are to be active in times like these, and two of which are concerned about the nature and content of the hope of the believer. So observation number one, we are to be active in prayer for the cause of the gospel. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. Paul's appeal for prayer takes the form of a present active imperative verb which means that this prayer is to be the ongoing, continual, ceaseless activity of the Thessalonian church. Paul is not asking for a one-off prayer request that can be satisfied by checking off a prayer for Paul on our devotional checklist and then going on to other matters. Paul is demanding a commitment to prayer from the Thessalonian church for the sake of the advance of the gospel. And in fact, it is too casual to read this as simply a request for prayer. It is not a request. It is an imperative. It is a command. The Thessalonians are to pray 
for the advance of the gospel and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It is then first and foremost a commitment to prayer that Paul requires from the Thessalonian Christians. But he also goes on to inform them of what he desires the content of these prayers to include. And there are two specific things that Paul highlights as issues of prayer. First, Christians are to pray for the advance of the gospel. Pray for us that the gospel may speed ahead and be honored. And second, Christians are to pray for the sake of those at risk for the gospel. Pray for us that we may be delivered from the hands of wicked and evil men. And I think the order here is important. Paul's first concern is not his own well-being. His first concern is not his personal comfort, his health, or even his safety. His first concern, his primary object, is quite simply the advance of the gospel. We are to be a people who pray for the advance of the gospel. Which means that we must be a people who care and who care a great deal about the advance of the gospel. We have tremendous concern regarding the moral decay of our culture, as well we should. But do we have any concern about the eternal fate of our neighbor? The word that Paul uses here for the gospel to speed ahead is literally the word to run. That the gospel would everywhere run ahead, unimpeded, unobstructed, to run to win in order to receive acceptance and the honors. It is racing language meant to evoke our desire to see the light of the gospel run ahead and triumph over the forces of darkness and unbelief. And Paul points out one compelling reason that the Thessalonian Christians should be so committed to this ministry of prayer for the advance of the gospel, and by extension, one reason that we should also be invested in this ministry, and that is quite simply because we ourselves are indebted to those who brought the gospel to us, even as happened among you. And so if we have any thankfulness in our hearts at all for what Christ has done for us, then what a small thing it should be for us to commit ourselves to work for and pray for the advance of the gospel in the lives of those around us. In days that are spiritually dark, the world does not need any more fretful Christians. We've got enough of those. The world does not need more fretful Christians. The world needs more praying Christians. Christians and Christians who are fervently praying for hearts to be changed and bonds to be broken by the saving, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to be a people who pray for the advance of the gospel, and we are to be a people who pray for those at risk for the sake of the gospel. Pray that we may be delivered from evil, wicked men, Paul writes. Just last week, we devoted time in our morning service for praying for the persecuted church. Because for all of the challenges that we face, and those challenges admittedly appear to be increasing, but for all of the challenges that you and I face, we have, as the writer to the Hebrews says, not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. But many of our brothers and sisters around the world are today risking their lives and the lives of their families and those that they love for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So then how is it possible that we could possibly sit disinterestedly by while our brothers and sisters in Christ give their lives for the sake of the name? We should make it a regular point of prayer to ask God for help and deliverance of Christians who are suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. To pray for our missionaries, those who have left the comfort of familiar culture and language and family and jobs and home in order to bring the good news of the gospel to every tongue, tribe, and nation. And so we are to unceasingly pray that the gospel would go forth, that it would run And that those bringing the gospel would be delivered from the hands of evil men. 
And what is the driving reason for these prayers? What is the force behind this gospel mission? Paul's answer to that question is quite simple, and yet I think it's pretty profound. Look at the end of verse 2. For not all have faith. The gospel must continue to run to the uttermost parts of the earth because not everyone believes. At first, this appears to be a rather over-obvious statement of fact. We know that not everyone believes. It's so self-apparent that one wonders why Paul thinks it needed to be said. But Paul is providing an insight for us that frames his argument here and the verses that will follow. The fact, you see, that not everyone believes is both the reason that the gospel must advance and the reason why it meets with the resistance of evil men. The gospel must go forth because not everyone believes, and yet those who do not believe are both the object and the obstacle to the advance of the gospel. The gospel must go forth because yet so many refuse to believe in Christ, and the gospel will be harshly resisted because so many yet resist Christ. And therefore, the threat that existed for the Apostle Paul at the hands of wicked and evil men exists for the Thessalonian believers who he's writing to as well, and, by extension, exists for us today. As long as not all believe, the gospel must go forth. And as long as not all believe, then those who live it and those who proclaim it will face the wrath of evil, wicked men. And so we must pray. And we must continue in praying. And while prayer is the obvious application of this first point, I would like to offer two additional brief thoughts of application here. First, we should take the measures of our prayer and see what we find. By that I mean, do the priorities normally reflected in our prayers reflect the same kind of gospel-centered priorities that are reflected in the Apostle Paul's commands. Do our prayers reveal an urgent, pressing concern for our unsaved co-workers, neighbors, family members, and friends? Are we asking God for opportunities and for courage to share our faith? Are we praying regularly that the gospel would run because not everyone believes? Or do we just jump immediately to prayers for comfort and health and safety for ourselves and those that we love? Second thought of application. We must be corporately and individually passionate about evangelism. Paul is well aware of the risks he is running. He knows he will be opposed by evil men who are a threat to his life, and yet he is running directly toward the spiritual front lines because not everyone believes. And do you know, I will often go out of my way to avoid having Saturday afternoon conversations and interactions with my neighbors because it would be an inconvenience. I do not stand here with my finger pointed at any of you saying that you must be passionate about evangelism. I stand here saying we must be passionate about evangelism and that I often fail, miserably fail, that test. I love when we have so many of our students entering the waters of baptism to proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ as we did last week. That is a special gift and a joy to our church. Praise the Lord. But you know, I also look forward to the day when our baptistry waters are spilling over from the neighbors and coworkers and friends and classmates to whom we faithfully witnessed Christ. In times of spiritual darkness, uncertainty, and danger, Christians should be people of activity and hope. And therefore, we must be active in prayer 
for the cause of the gospel. Observation number two, we have reason for confidence despite the presence of adversity. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. It will not be hard for the Thessalonian believers to make the connection that if wicked and evil men oppose the Apostle Paul and threaten his ministry, that surely evil and wicked men will arise to oppose and threaten the Thessalonian church. Indeed, as we have already noted, the Thessalonian Christians were already suffering at this point for the sake of the gospel. And so for that reason, Paul quickly pivots at this point from a petition for prayer regarding his own safety to now a message of comfort and encouragement to the Thessalonians regarding the security that they have in Christ. And in order to underscore the comfort and confidence that believers have in Christ, Paul introduces this section with a little wordplay. Those who seek to advance the gospel are at risk because not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. Paul uses the title Lord to refer almost exclusively to Christ throughout his letters. And so while Paul frequently says elsewhere that God the Father is faithful, here he is saying Christ is faithful. We do not have a flighty Savior. We do not have a Savior who abandons us at the slightest provocation or threat or resistance. We do not have a Savior who is subject to whim and to fancy or who is willing to relinquish his claims on us even when we are fearful and faint-hearted and faithless. We do not have a Savior who measures his commitment to us against the depth of our commitment to him but instead a Savior who measures his commitment to us against the greatness of his own character. Our inconstancy is like shadow and smoke. It is here and then gone. We are all variants and chains, shifting motivations, evolving desires. We are like all those fallen leaves in our backyards at the moment, there and then gone with the wind and then back again when the wind changes. But not Christ. Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. When we are faithless, he remains faithful. There is no change in him, and therefore there is no alteration in his disposition toward me and you. There is no more comforting truth to be had in the whole of the universe than the single waking thought, but Christ is faithful. And therefore, a Christian living without a confident hope is a Christian living without a thought for Christ. And better still for us, the faithfulness of Christ is joined to his power. Not only is Christ faithful, but Christ is able. Able to establish. Able to protect and to guard. Oh, what joy is contained in these words of Jesus. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. And therefore, when Paul says that Christ will establish and guard his own, it is the end of all fear. Paul has just finished mentioning the threat posed by wicked and evil men, and yet, as Paul has acknowledged elsewhere, our battle ultimately is not against flesh and blood. It is Satan himself that is the supreme adversary of the people of God, because behind the program of evil men is a far more sinister opponent, the evil one himself, as Paul explicitly mentions here. We will be protected and guarded against the evil one. But despite the presence of Satan, Paul yet expresses his absolute confidence that the Thessalonians will remain established and secure because their protector is faithful and because he is 
Abel. Most of us are familiar with Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Luther's original wording has received a fair amount of editing over the years. But I think a few stanzas from Luther's original capture the heart of Paul's confidence. By our own strength is nothing won. We court at once disaster. Their fights for us the champion whom God has named our master. Would you know his name? Jesus Christ the same. Lord Sabaoth is he, no other God can be. The field is his to hold it. And though the fiends on every hand were threatening to devour us, we would not waver from our stand. They cannot overpower us. This world's prince may rave, However he behave, he can do no ill. God's truth abideth still. One little word shall fell him. That word they never can dismay, however much they batter, for God himself is in the fray, and nothing else can matter. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Thought then of application. How is our confident hope in Christ shaping the way that we live in these interesting times? What does it look like to live with the certain knowledge that we have a faithful Savior who is committed to establishing and guarding us? What does that do to worry and doubt? What does that do to our anxieties? This past week, we started a paper Thanksgiving turkey with our family, and each day, one of us will fill in a feather of the turkey with something that one member of our family is thankful for. When my turn came around this week, the kids asked what I am thankful for, and I enthusiastically shouted, for my wife! For whatever reason, this struck the funny bone of the kids who began to laugh uproariously. They are a pretty easy audience most nights. <laughs> when we got around to Sabina, who is four, we asked what she was thankful for, and she shouted, For my future husband! <laughs> that got a chuckle mostly from Corinne, not so much from me. I made... <laughs> I made, a, I made a mental note that I'd be acquiring a shotgun in my near future. <laughs> we then got around to Benjamin, who is two. He had been laughing along at my answer, and he thought his sister's response was also pretty good. So when we asked him what he was thankful for, he yelled, For my future father! <laughs> Excuse me. Run that one back. What did you just say? <laughs> now that sent me down a chain of worry pretty quick. In fact, as I figure it, I've got a few things I need to be anxious about now. First, what does this kid know? <laughs> or, what is this kid planning? <laughs> does my son want a future father? And if so... What is so exactly bad about the current father? <laughs> the last thought to me is most distressing of all, is Corinne in on this? <laughs> we are good at worrying. We are good at allowing our minds to run after worst case scenarios, to build these huge monsters in our imagination, whether real or imagined. We are good at fretting over the future. It is good and right that we are disturbed by the moral erosion of our society. It is right that we are astonished and grieved by the cultural chaos and insanity that's been produced by the sexual revolution in our country. 
It is good for us to wrestle with how we can protect our children from the lies that our society would have them believe. We are right to be horrified by the wanton disregard and disdain for human life that we have just witnessed in this state. And we are right to be concerned about the increasing intolerance and animosity toward Christian faith in our country. But brothers and sisters, it is simply wrong for us to live in fear when all authority belongs to the risen Christ. Instead, we are called to live in the midst of these problems and perplexities, in the middle of these doubts and these dangers, as lights in a dark place, knowing all the while that we are secure because he is faithful. In times of uncertainty, darkness, and danger, Christians are to be people of activity and hope. Observation number three, we are to be active in obedience. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. Paul has just finished stating that the Lord will establish and guard the Thessalonian church, but what is the result of the church being established? The result is the church's obedience to the word of truth. And moreover, it is in fact in times of uncertainty and adversity that the simple acts of obedience to the commands of Christ are the greatest protection and defense against the attacks of the enemy. And therefore, Paul is able to express his hope and his confidence that in the Lord, the Thessalonians will walk in a continued obedience. And that's already the reputation happily for this young Thessalonian church. And so Paul is comforted that they are and that they will continue to be obedient to his word and to the commands of Christ. So good for the Thessalonians. But what about us? What is the mission statement of our church? That's a real question. We are called to glorify God. It is a powerful mission statement because it is true for us corporately as a church, but it is also a mission statement that is true for us individually as Christians. We are called to glorify God. But how do we do that? Question number four in the catechism that we do with our kids asks, how can you glorify God? Answer, by loving him and doing what he commands. It is not through grandiose gestures or phenomenal accomplishments that we demonstrate that we love God and bring him glory. It's not by having everything all figured out. It's not by having the answer to all of life's problems or great theological questions or even having the solutions to every cultural crisis that we face. Instead, we glorify God in the simple quietness of mundane acts of faithful obedience. By living faithfully here and now, in this place, in this time, in this moment, in this culture, in the job, in the neighborhood, in the marriage, in the family, in the singleness, in the loss, in the plenty. By living where God has called us in faithful obedience. So because we love the Lord, we love his word. And because we love the Lord and we love his word, we obey the word and we hold to it and we cling to it. And it is in such simple acts of everyday obedience, unremarkable obedience, that we resist the threats of evil, wicked men and destroy the designs of the evil one himself. As one hymnist penned, and though the tempter drives me still, I cling to your commands. Observation number four. 
the source of our hope, not our fears, must direct our hearts. Verse 5, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul begins our passage by asking for prayer from others, and he concludes it by modeling effective prayer for others. And what a prayer it is. This is sadly the kind of verse that we all too frequently read over in about three seconds in our daily devotional reading. And it is also the kind of verse that the Puritans would quite rightly write a book about. In times of spiritual darkness, uncertainty, and danger, our hearts will be directed somewhere. And without careful attention, our hearts will inevitably run down the pathways of fear, anxiety, and worry that our sin natures incline us to. That is like water running downhill. The blessing of the information age is the ease of access to information. And that just so happens to be the curse of the information age. We are daily inundated with information, and the problem is that, number one, much of the information that we encounter ranges from the concerning to the terrifying. Number two, we don't know what information is true. And number three, we have too much information about too much. By which I mean that in previous generations, you knew in the moment when something bad was happening to you or to your neighbors, and everything else you tended to learn about weeks after the fact. But today, most of us carry in our pockets the ability to know up to the moment when something bad is happening to us, to our neighbors, to our community, in our state, in our country, or when some geopolitical conflict thousands of miles away threatens to throw the global economy into a tailspin and set our retirement accounts back seven years. And you wonder why half of the population struggles with crippling anxiety. I openly confess to all of you that I am a serial warrior. It is undoubtedly one of my particular besetting sins. It's one I have to regularly wage war against. And so I need, I need 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. Because when I am tempted to succumb to worry, when I am tempted to allow my mind to run away with me, to carry me along with my anxieties and fears and to build worst-case scenarios that defy imagination and description, when, as the hymnist says, all around my soul gives way, I need to direct my heart to the one who is my hope and stay. And Paul puts forward two sources of our hope and comfort for the believer. And the first is the love of God. how often we take such an incomprehensible truth for granted as a common thing. There could be nothing common about it. The sovereign God of heaven and earth, the God who establishes every earthly kingdom and who fashioned the universe in its every subatomic particular has set his everlasting affection on us. The God who reigns and who rules, who is from everlasting to everlasting, the one whose mighty arm leveled the powers of Egypt and Babylon and Syria and who will one day rise to destroy the nations, this supreme majesty loves us with a fierce and awesome and indestructible love. As we read in our scripture reading this morning from Romans chapter 8, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My heart needs to be directed again and again to that fear-destroying truth. The second source of comfort that Paul sets before us is the steadfastness of Christ. So much of what we cling to for life and for joy and for safety, for hope in this world, is simply vapor and vanity. 
the idols of our health and of our youth, of our heroes and our politics, of our money and our friends. Everything that promised us salvation and escape and meaning and purpose is like grasping at smoke when you need it the most. As the writer said, time, like an ever-flowing stream, bears all her sons away, and with it exposes all of the transient nothingness we clung to like a life raft. These idols of our hearts are kind of like a movie set for a cowboy western, with large, impressive-looking storefronts that conceal that there is nothing of substance behind them. It is simply an empty facade. And then there is Jesus. Here is substance. Here is solid ground. Here is unshakable, steadfast redemption and ransom and justification to build one's life and one's eternal hope upon. Here is solid rock. Here is cornerstone. Here is the one in whom every promise of God is kept, in whom all righteousness is joined substitutionary atonement, in whom is perfect holiness, united eternal love. Here is the one in whom divine justice is satisfied and divine mercy is mediated. Here is our safe harbor. He is our living hope. Christ is steadfast. I can remember when I was a little boy going out fishing with my dad and my grandpa, and in the tradition of horned men not catching anything, but generally having a pretty good time. I remember those warm summer days, the sunlight would be skipping across the surface of the water with the boat gently moving to the rhythm of the waves. And often my grandpa would begin to sing a hymn that I dearly loved as a boy, that I was always asking him to sing. It was a hymn that was perfect for singing in boats. I think it's perfect for this text this morning. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfurl their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift, when the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? I would often join with him in singing out the chorus as we sat together in our boat. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Direct your hearts to this truth this morning, that a world in a world of shadow and vanity and vapor, Christ is steadfast. In times of spiritual darkness, uncertainty, and danger, Christians are to be a people of activity and hope. As children, we quickly learn to be afraid of the dark. But in Christ, we put away childish things. As we walk in faith with the one who said, fear not, I am with you. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, how often it is true that our spirits fail within us. How often we are like Peter and we take our eyes off of Christ and turn them to the turbulent waves that are around us and fear that we will perish. And yet we read that you are faithful. And so it is in faith and in hope that we commit ourselves wholly and utterly upon your love and care for us, knowing that in that love there is nothing that can separate us if we are in Christ Jesus. And so we thank you for that in his precious name. Amen.